Hey guys, um, I wanted to show you guys about uh, how I would read through this story. I know uh, it's a little bit of a strange story. I know that uh, it's been a while since we've looked at the Brothers Grimm's tales. This is not a common one that you might have seen before. It's not like Cinderella or Snow White. Um, it's kind of, I haven't even read it before I took a look at this one. Um, and I want to show you what kind of goes through my mind when I'm looking at one of these stories and how am I analyzing it. Um, and, and how would I get the answers, basically. Uh, so I'll take you a walkthrough, and you can kind of watch, and, you know, if there are any questions that you had, hopefully this will answer some of them. Um, okay, so this is from last week's assignment. This is something that has already been past due, so you should have all had it handed in to me. So the first things I'm going to do is... Let me just equip my pen here. Uh, let's do it a color. Uh, let's pick... Uh, I'm not a big fan of green today. Let's do... No, green's fun. All right, green. Green it is. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is take a look at my title, because my title's right here. <clears throat> now I know we have the idea of a bird. Uh, okay, so first thing I'm going to do is think about what a bird means. And now I know that uh, in these questions there are a lot of things called um, um, figurative language or figurative devices. Uh, basically, this is just an umbrella term for things that we've already talked about in class. I just haven't called it by its actual term. This is why I'm practicing my drawing during <laughs> during this shutdown. Um, that's my picture of an umbrella. Underneath the umbrella, we have things like um, symbolism. We have things like metaphors. We have things like uh, similes. We have uh, juxtaposition. So think of it as just kind of this nice big umbrella term of what we're going to sort of take a look for. Uh, that's a very simplified kind of definition of what this, this term means. Um, obviously, we can get a lot more in depth in terms of what does and doesn't constitute figurative language, but I want you to kind of think of it like this umbrella for all of these terms that we go over in class. Okay, um, and if you don't know what some of these terms are, I notice some of you are able to kind of use metaphors and similes um, and things like uh, oh, we're using green hyperbole. Hyper. That's not high school hyperbole. Okay, <laughs> H Y perbole. Um, if you don't know what they are, I'll show you how you could still answer the same question, uh, maybe just not getting to the word that you want, but still kind of describing what's going on through using analysis of the story. Okay, um, so either way, let's kind of jump in. I want to show you how I'm going to be analyzing this. So uh, when we're taking a look at this idea of a bird in the title, uh, we're looking at this idea of symbolism. Okay, this is in this week's assignment as well. We've talked, I gave you a, a kind of that YouTube video that talks about the idea of that an object can mean more than what it is simply presenting as, right? So uh, it gave you kind of the Disney version of things versus the real version of things. Disney uses symbolism quite a lot. They pull on a lot of Grimm's Brothers tales um, and symbolism is really built into those stories. So uh, taking a look at this, right, we have the idea of, of a bird. So I'm going to think about what can a bird mean other than just being um, in itself a bird. That's its wing. Again, <laughs> working on art. Um, so other than just being a bird, what can it mean? Well, a bird can do things that we can't, right? What can a bird do that we can't do? We, we can't fly. Okay, well, what does flying mean to us? Imagine right now, just close your eyes and think about what it would be like, uh, especially right now, right? Um, if you had that ability to fly, what would that mean to you? Well, for some, it might mean this idea of freedom. You could go wherever you wanted to at a moment's notice, right? Um, you have that space, you have that ability to just to leave your house and to fly wherever you want. And, and you know, um, so, you know, when we're looking at this idea of a bird, we might think of this idea of freedom. We might think of this idea of, um, you know, um, getting away from troubles. Right? You could quickly um, and, and somewhat safely maneuver yourself away from anything that's a threat to you. 
Okay, so when we're looking at this idea of birds, we're usually thinking about flying, we're thinking about being able to leave, we're think we're, we have autonomy, we have power over where we go. So, um, when we're looking at this idea of the bird, specifically we know that we're looking at an owl. Now an owl is somebody who hunts, right? It's a predator bird. Uh, it's not simply just picking up little kind of grubs from the ground. It, it has really sharp talons, it has a sharp beak, it is, it is a keen hunter, it is um, a bird that, you know, uh, a lot of other birds are afraid of, and, and small birds, mice, um, we have that idea of a hunter, we have this idea attached with an owl, uh, wisdom, right, think back to Winnie the Pooh, um, now obviously it's more satirical in Winnie the Pooh because the owl there is, is a bit of a Pharisee, he's, he's an academic, but kind of talks himself in circles, um, and, you know, uh, satirical and, and satire kind of works, you'll probably get into maybe a little more in grade 10, uh, maybe grade 11, and what that looks like. But basically, you know, he, in Winnie the Pooh, they're sort of making fun of that idea of the owl being the source of all knowledge. But typically, um, right, an owl means wisdom. It means, uh, you know, that, that idea of um, kind of foresight into what's going on. Um, because they're wise, because they have such big eyes. Uh, so when we're looking at this idea, I, it, I'm going to assume that the story has something to do with freedom, right? Uh, freedom to choose where you go. This idea of something that is a hunter, maybe something that is smart, this idea of, of wisdom. Um, and that's kind of be what I go into the story looking at, right? Before I even know what the story is about. Now, so we've looked at the title first and foremost. Now, the second thing we look at is the author. The Brothers Grimm. What do we know about the Brothers Grimm? Well, we know that these are German stories or in the Germanic folklore. Okay, so we know that they come from Germany, um, but we know that they're also, they were oral stories. This means they were stories that were passed down from generation to generation. We know that they are stories to teach a lesson that was their main uh, focus, was to teach young children about the world, about, you know, how to live in the world and, and you know, what does, what does it mean to have right and wrong in the world, okay? So, uh, title, author, let's get into the actual story itself. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do, it's a nice short story, it's not too long, it's about, oh two pages. So with a story this short, I'm going to read it through once, take a look at the questions, uh, and kind of give it another read through. So the first time we read through, we're going to read for plot. We're going to read through to know what happens. Uh, and then the second read through, we'll do a little bit more of an analysis. Okay. So starting right around here, two or 300 years ago, when people were far from being so crafty and cunning as they are nowadays. Okay. So we know that you know, being far from crafting and cutting, they're not. Uh, they are nowadays. An extraordinary event took place in a little town. By some mischance, one of the great owls, called horned owls, had come from the neighboring woods into the barn of one of the townsfolk in the nighttime. And when the day broke, did not dare venture forth again from her retreat for fear of the other birds, which raised terrible outcry whenever she appeared. Okay, um, because there's that idea of fear. Okay, there's fear of this bird because she is a hunter. We know it is a she, um, and we know that it's a great horned owl, right? Or sorry, a horned owl, which is kind of a, a predator, uh, but also someone who, you know, hunts well, but is also, um, again, that idea of wisdom has come in the night. Okay. In the morning, when the manservant went into the barn to fetch some straw, he was so mightily alarmed at the sight of the owl sitting there in a corner that he ran away and announced to his master that a monster, the like of which he had never set eyes on in his life, and which could devour a man without the slightest difficulty, was sitting in the barn, rolling its eyes about in its head. Okay, so a couple of things are going on here. Uh, now, a manservant, again, we're using older language. Um, where am I? A manservant. A manservant is going to be uh, just that, a servant. So he's going to be somebody who would have helped out in a farm. Okay, so he went into a bar, barn to fetch some straw. So he's doing his morning chores. Uh, so we can just make a quick note here. First sighting 
of the owl. Okay, uh, we also have that reaction of fear. Oh, perfect. The questions actually show up right here, too. Okay. Um, beautiful. Okay. Uh, let's continue on. Like I said, we'll read through the story first. I know you already, said the master. You have courage enough to chase a blackbird about the fields, but when you see a dead hen lying, you have to get a stick before you go near it. I must go see for myself what kind of monster it is. Okay, so we already have that name of monster being attached to this owl. Uh, there's a preconceived notion or an idea before this man goes to see the owl that it is a monster. Um, and he's saying a little bit to this manservant, right? You have courage enough to chase a blackbird. Not to catch the blackbird, right? Just to chase the blackbird. Uh, but when you see a dead hen lying, right? Right here, when you see this dead hen lying, you have to get a stick before you go near it, right? So it's kind of that, that courage when when you know there's no chance of him catching the thing right so there's there's courage courage in the chase i'm going to say uh right but when there's actually the prize to get you know when there's actually something to to do he gets afraid and and he leaves or he has to get a stick in order to protect himself from something that is dead, right? There's courage in the chase, but when that when the chase is over, he's afraid. Okay. Um, sorry, let's go here. I must go and see for myself what kind of monster it is, added the master. Right, this is the person who owns the farm. And went boldly into the granary and looked about him. The granary is just a place where they would keep things like the straw that the, the servant was kept fetching for the master. When, however, he saw the strange, grim creature with his own eyes, he was no less terrified than the servant had been. With two bounds, he sprang out, ran to his neighbors, and begged them imploringly to lend him assistance against an unknown and dangerous beast, or else the whole town might be in danger if it were to break loose out of the barn, where it was shut up. Okay, um, so we have kind of like this fear um, rising. Right? Think about a time where you might have been scared of something uh, and other people might not have been so scared until you start getting a little bit more afraid and then it, it's kind of contagious, right? It catches on. Somebody else gets afraid of something and then, you know, everyone's kind of afraid of that one thing. Can you think of something that maybe would have been um, taken um, a little bit like this kind of fear mongering in our daily life right now? Right. Uh, a time that, for example, that I would have seen, uh, especially is when there is like a, a wasp in the, in the school or a bee. Um, right. People get really afraid and one person might get afraid and then it kind of catches on. And then you have a whole classroom kind of screaming at this bee that, you know, maybe if you were on your own, you wouldn't have been so afraid of it. Or, for example, we could see this when people start panic buying things. Right. One person is afraid that they might not be able to get something. So they buy up a lot which causes other people to start panicking because they're starting to see lower amounts of that thing. And then on and on and on until that thing is completely sold out of the stores. Right? We've been seeing a lot of this kind of panic buying, uh, especially in recent times, where people are, are just kind of that fear is starting to rise. We have a bit of, um, of, of like a group of people who are now afraid. Um, we have this kind of like townspeople who are all being afraid of, of, a, of an owl. Right? Because that owl was already labeled a monster, and now it's kind of starting to fear monger. All right, continuing on. A great noise and clamor arose in all the streets. The townsmen came armed with spears, hay forks, scythes, and axes, as if they were going out against an enemy. Finally, the senators appeared with the, the burgomaster at their head. Okay, um, now as I'm reading through, I have no idea what a burgomaster is, so I'm going to underline that and kind of keep that in mind. But obviously... Right? They're all coming with weapons. Um, they're going out against an enemy. It has a name, right? It's no longer just an owl or a spider or it's the enemy. Right? We have to destroy the enemy. Um, and then they, they, they came and they appeared with the burgomaster at their head. So I'm assuming that this is just kind of continuing on. Like the pace is building. People are getting more afraid. When they had drawn up in the marketplace, they marched to the barn and surrounded it on all sides. 
Thereupon, one of the most courageous of them stepped forth and entered with his spear lowered, but came running out immediately afterwards with a shriek as pale as death. Okay, I know from the questions this is going to come up. And could not utter a single word. Yet two others ventured in, but they fared no better. Okay, so everyone's walking into this barn, and then they come running out screaming. Keep in mind, this is all because they saw, you know, a, a, a bird. <laughs> so think of kind of how, how absurd or how silly it is that they're screaming at a bird. It's just a bird. Okay. At last, one step forth, a great strong man who was famous for his warlike deeds, right? So he's been in battle. He's seen the worst of it. And said, you will not drive away the monster merely by by merely looking at him. We must be in earnest here. We must be honest here, right? We have a little bit of, of, of irony here, right? Uh, to be ironic means that you are, um, it's the opposite of what you were expecting. In, in the most simplest terms, again, we can get a lot more complex in this. And if you've learned about irony, uh, there are definitely more, you know, subtleties and nuances to it. But boiling it down, um, it's the opposite of what you would expect. So he's talking about we must be honest here. But we're not being honest, right? We're calling this owl... I'm just going to do little wings. <laughs> uh, we're calling this owl a monster. We're calling this owl the enemy. Um, and, and so it's, it's ironic that we're talking about honesty here. Now, we could read this on a lot of different levels. So again, we're reading for plot first. Um, but it's, it's ironic that we're talking about honesty here. Okay, uh, but I see that you have all become fearful... For not one of you dares to encounter the animal. Okay, we have a change. It's not the enemy anymore, it's the animal. He ordered them to give him some armor, had a sword and spear brought, and armed himself. Okay, so again, ironic that he's talking about this animal. This this quite small animal in relation to how big the man would be. Um, but he's kind of, you know, arming himself out to the hilt. Like he has a, a sword and a spear and armor. Um, imagine if you had to, you know, get a sword and a spear and armor to kill the spider in your, um, in your bathroom, right? It, it would be a little bit strange. It'd be a little bit overkill. It'd be just a little bit too much, but this is how far this guy's going. Okay. The two barn doors were open and they saw the owl, which in the meantime had perched herself in the middle of a great crossbeam. Okay, so she's right. The crossbeam is going to be at the ceiling. Um, you know, it's just, it's a, a plank of wood that runs across the ceiling where she can kind of sit on top. He had a ladder brought and when he raised it, he made ready to climb up. They all cried out to him. Again, we have that fear starting to roll up. They all cried out to him that he was to bear himself bravely and commended him to St. George, who slew the dragon. Okay, so if we don't know who St. George is, we know that it's somebody who uh, went up against a dragon. Now we are comparing this tiny little owl to this giant, fire-breathing dragon. That's, that's my dragon. Okay, there's the fire. Okay, so uh, a bit, again, overkill. They're comparing him to this this story of a person who was truly brave, right? But in here, we're not really being brave. It's, it's an owl. Again, it's a small, relatively small bird. When he had just got the draw uh, to the top, and the owl perceived that he had designs on her, and was so bewildered by the crowd, I'm just going to highlight this one because I know that's a question, and was so bewildered by the crowd and the shouting, and he knew not how to escape, she rolled her eyes, ruffled her feathers, flapped her wings, snapped her beak, and cried, to it, to who, in a sharp voice. Okay? If you've ever gone outside and, um, you know, disturbed a, a, a goose, a seagull, any kind of bird, right? I mean, when we were young, you know, most people would go run after the birds to make them fly, right? That's kind of like your, your fun thing to do as a kid. Or if you haven't, I'm sure you've seen little kids run after birds. Um, they'll do things like ruffle their fl feathers, flap their wings, um, especially Canadian geese, right? They, they will snap their beak at you. Um, they can be somewhat 
scary birds. Um, but you know, you might be a little startled and be taken aback if, if something is flapping its wings and clucking its beak at you, but I doubt that you're going to be terrified. However, let's see what happens. Strike home, screamed the crowd outside to the valiant hero. Strike home, so they want him to hit the bird with the sword. Anyone who is standing where I am standing, answered he, would not cry, strike home. Cer he certainly did plant his foot one rung higher on the ladder, but then he began to tremble, half fainting, went back again. Okay, so again, we have this thing where he is, you know, the, the fear is getting to him. Right? Sometimes the fear is more terrifying than the thing that we should be afraid of. And now no one was left who dared to put himself in such danger. The monster, said they, has poisoned and mortally wounded the very strongest man among us by snapping at him and just breathing on him. Are we too to risk our lives? They took counsel as to what they ought to do to prevent the whole town from being destroyed. Okay, um... Again, we're kind of overkilling here, right? The idea of risking your life to shoo out a bird. You wouldn't say that if, if it was a spider in your house, right? You might be a little bit scared, but, you know, if you're afraid of spiders, but you're not risking your life, right? It's not like we live in Australia where the spiders can actually kill you. Australia is terrifying. I don't know how they do it. Kudos to them. <laughs> um... But, but the owl is not going to hurt them, right? It might, it might nip at their hands, um, but it's, it's not going to be a, you know, a fatal nip. It's not, it's not going to kill them. So they, they're going to try to figure out uh, how to prevent the town from being destroyed from this owl. For a long time, everything seemed to be of no use. But at, the length, but at length, the burgomaster found an expedient, right? So we have, again, this person. Must be some high rank. My opinion, said he, is that we ought, out of the common purse, pay for this barn. The common purse, right? It would be money that they all put together. To pay for this barn, and whatsoever corn, straw, or hay it contains, and thus indemnify the owner, and then burn down the whole building. So they're going to pay off the owner, and then burn the building down. And the terrible beasts within it. So they're going to burn the whole house down to get rid of the spider. Or in this case, they're going to burn the barn down to get rid of the owl. Again, it's a little much. Thus, no one would have to endanger his life. This is no time for thinking of expense. All agreed with him. So they set fire to the barn at all four corners, and with it the owl was miserably burnt. Let anyone who will not believe it go thither and acquire for himself. Okay? So those who don't believe what went on, let them go figure out that, you know, when fear starts to rise and people start to panic, sometimes we do things like burn the entire barn down to get rid of the tiny little bird inside. And what a, what a shame that is, right? How much we can overreact to some things. And when one person gets afraid and more people jump on it, that sometimes we'll, we'll get to this point, this ridiculous point, where we'll burn the whole place down because of this tiny little thing that could easily be dealt with. Right? So, okay. That is the entire story. Yep, that is the entire story. Okay, now, coming to the questions, uh which are actually posted in the story, which is really nice. So I will answer these questions. Um, I'm going to do it orally, uh, which means I'm, I'm going to say it, but they're kind of, they're all up here. So it's kind of, right, nine questions. And I think there's a few more than nine. Okay. Okay, perfect. So these two questions are the only ones that are not written above. So let's go above and let's take a look at questions one, two, nine. Okay, um, so for this rendition and this read-through, let's switch the color of our pen uh, to, let's do orange, why not? Orange? Is orange too bright? No. Okay, we're going to do orange. Okay, 
Number one, what specifically motivates the horned owl to remain hidden in the barn? Now, I remember this was right up around the first paragraph. All right, so the first introduction to our horned owl is right here. Okay. Um, by some mischance, one of the great owls, right? This is something that we should revere. This is something that we should kind of bow down to. The horned owl had come from a neighboring woods into the barn of the town folks at nighttime when day did not dare, or sorry, when day broke, did not dare to venture forth. Again, from her retreat, from her spot where she retreated to the barn. For fear of the other birds, which raised a terrible outcry when she appeared. So, why did she remain hidden in the barn? Well, she had fear of the other birds. She might seem like this big predator, um, but she's, she's not, right? She's, she's afraid of the other birds because the other birds cry out. They make fun of her. They're scared of her. Um, you know, like if we were to personify or make her a person, um, she would be able to kind of not have any friends, right? Just people are, are kind of screaming at her whenever she walks by. So that is why she remains hidden in the barn. She doesn't want the other birds to, to cry out when they see her. They don't want, she doesn't want the birds to make fun of her, essentially. It's all, it's all fear-based, right? Okay, um, number two. The manservant's description of the owl is best considered an example of which literary device? Explain your thinking. Okay, so here is one that is a little bit tricky. Okay, so let's take a look at where the manservant, you know what, let me use a different color just because it's very all very close to each other. Uh, let's use yellow. Okay, the manservant's description of the owl is best considered an example of which literary device. Explain your thinking. Now, if you're not sure which literary device that we're talking about, uh, let's take a look at how the manservant is describing the owl. Okay, so in the morning when the manservant went to the barn to fetch some straw, he was so mightily alarmed at the sight of the owl, so we have him meeting the owl there in the corner that he ran away and announced to his, to his master that a monster the like of which he had never set eyes on in his life, which could devour a man without the slightest difficulty, was sitting in the barn. Okay, so we have, if I'm sitting here and trying to explain exactly, you know, how the manservant's description of the owl, um, what is it? You know, if, if you're not sure about the actual terms, you could say things like, it... It is an over-exaggeration. Sorry for my messy writing. Um, it's an over-exaggeration. You could say he is making it or making the owl out to be scarier than it is. Right? All of these things would kind of describe the literary device that maybe we just don't have the word for. And and from there, I could say, you could see this in the story when he says, he calls him a monster, that it's a monster that can devour a man without difficulty, um, that it's so horrible, he's never seen anything so horrible. Now, uh, this might take a little bit of extra looking at, but this term right here is called a hyperbole. Let me make sure I get this right. Hi. <laughs> Hyperbole. Okay, um, this is called a hyperbole, right? Um, yeah, okay, sorry, I was just double checking my spelling. Uh, it's called a hyperbole, and so a hyperbole is uh, exaggerated language to, to describe something, right? To describe something or someone or some place, right? Some, some noun. Um, and the purpose of it for this one is to, to show the fear again, right? This is the mood that's going through this whole story, to show the fear that this monster is having. Okay, um, the next one, let's switch colors. Let's do, we haven't done blue yet. Let's do 
blue. Okay, perfect. So number three. When the master responds to his manservant's description of the owl, what does the master imply about his servant? Okay, so again, we're in the next paragraph right here. I know you already. You have the courage enough to chase a blackbird about the fields when you see a dead head lying. You have to get a stick before you go near it. I must go and see for myself what kind of monster this is. Okay, someone says, Hey, hey, friend, I've seen this terrifying thing. And if you're like, yeah, okay, okay. I need to go see it for myself. Think about why that, you know, you might be saying this. You know, you, you're, you're happy to chase something around, but, when, you know, when you see something dead, you, you have to get a stick. You're so afraid of things. Right? In this way, the manservant, or the, the master's implying that the servant, or the manservant, as his name is here, um, isn't, isn't reliable, right? Like, I, I can't, he can't trust what this manservant's saying. So I must go see for myself what kind of monster it is. I must go see kind of what the thing to be afraid is. Okay, so he's skeptical of his servant. All right, we're going to go back to orange. For number four, the phrase as pale as death is best considered an example of which type of literary device? Explain your thinking. Now, let's find this one. I underlined it right here. Okay. Now, if I was doing a very cold reading without looking at the questions first, I might have to read until I found it. Um, but I knew that one was coming up, so I underlined it. So it's right here. It's pale as death. Okay. So, uh, what's going on in the story? So, we know that, that the owl has come. We know, oh, right, people are coming in and out of the barn screaming. Um, and they are as pale as death. Okay. Now, again, if we don't know, you know, um, what the, the name of the literary device is, that's okay. Right? We could still talk about how is it being used. So you could say, you know, the, is it one man? Yep, it's one man. The man is being compared to, or you could say the alive man is being compared to a dead man. Okay, this comparison is being used to show to show what? What is it being? What is it showing us about this man who's alive? What does it say about his fear? To show that his fear, or the man's fear, is enough to kill him. Maybe not in a literal way, but, but like he's so afraid that he looks like he's died. Right? Again, we're showing that fear. Now, um, if you aren't sure about what that's called, that's okay. This is a great answer right here, right? Um, this one right here is called the simile. And boiled down again to its most basic idea is that we are having a comparison of two unlike things using like or as. Again, it gets more complex than this, but boiled down to its most basic idea is that we're comparing two unlike things using like or as, typically in a sentence, right? Uh, so you'll see as pale as death. Um, bright like the sun. Um, blue as a a sapphire, I think I spelled that wrong. Um, but, you know, you, you kind of get the idea here. We're comparing two and like things to show uh, the, the commonality between them um, to show that it's kind of, it reminds you of this thing. Okay? Um, so, you know, keep all in mind that, again, you know, you might not have the language for it for the literary example, but if you can tell me what, what it's doing, uh, that's great, right? Like, that's showing me that you are, you're engaged and you're thinking and that, you know, you can kind of analyze this literature. Okay, uh, on to number six. 
refer to the highlighted portion of the text, explain the situational irony present in this sec in this section. Uh, so you actually have the term right here, situational irony, which you can go online and take a look uh, of what the definition is, but situational irony. Um, when the outcome is the opposite of what sorry, um, is expected. Lots and lots of notifications. Um, sorry. Too many things in our world buzz now and drives me crazy. Okay, so uh, we have, you know, lots and lots of, uh, sorry, um, sorry, right, situational irony, the outcome is the opposite of what is expected. So, you know, if you expect that, uh, you know, if you have a character who is, uh, I don't know, running towards the edge of a cliff and then he jumps and you expect him to fall, but actually he grows some wings, that might be ironic. Kind of a strange thing. Um, sorry, I can't come up with a better example right now. But that's that's kind of the idea, right? The outcome is opposite of what is expected. Okay, so if I'm going back here and we're taking a look at, you know, you have... What's going on in the story? Right, we have our strong man with warlike deeds. Uh, and he goes into the barn. We have a man who has faced death in war. And he comes up against an owl. So he goes up and he, you know, he goes up and he faces this owl. And what would you expect somebody who is a warrior, somebody who is a soldier? Do you think that they could um, fight an owl? Yeah, right? You expect that they'd be able to, to kind of fight this owl. But is he able to? No, right? You know, anyone who is standing where I am standing would not cry, strike home, right? And then, you know, he, he at one point even is like half fainting, you know, like this is, this is someone who you would expect to be a strong and, and, you know, brave warrior who is bested by a bird. <laughs> so we have a little bit of situational irony here. Okay, number seven, analyze the analogy of the famous warrior to St. George. Okay, so uh, again, you can take a look at if there are any words here that you don't understand. Um, but, you know, we're, we're calling this warrior, this, this hero, this soldier who's fighting this guy, um, he's, he's being commended to St. George who slew a dragon. So even if you didn't take the time to look up, you know, who St. George was, again, St. George was somebody who bested a dragon. And, and really, when we're looking at, like, my little doodle here, you know, which one's bigger, the, the dragon or the owl? Okay, so is it fair to call this soldier, is it fair and accurate to call him uh, St. George? Is it fair to compare a guy who is battling this with a guy who is battling this? Probably not. Okay, um, pro probably not. I mean, you can make your own arguments, but... You know, in my eyes, you know, no. <laughs> they're, they're very different sizes. You know, someone who's slaying a dragon, someone who's, who's slaying an owl. Okay, number eight. Discern the meaning of an uncommon phrase. What does it mean to have designs on someone? All right. I know this is in here. I highlighted it in green. Okay, so right now. Okay, so he had designs on her. It's a strange old phrase. It's a little bit strange. It's, it's strange. It's definitely strange. Um, but if I'm taking a look at what the situation is, and this is part of that context clues that we went over and how to read with context clues, right? Uh, we have this strong soldier, and when he had got to the top, the owl perceived that he had designs on her and was so bewildered by the crowd and the shouting and knew not how to escape. So this is what she did. Okay, so, you know, he's climbing up this ladder. Right, he's slowly going up it, and she's sitting right here on a beam. 
I'm just going to give her her little... That looks more spider-like. Anyways, this is the bird. <laughs> there we go. More bird-like. I don't know. So she's watching him, right? So if he has... If she knows he has designs on her, she knows that he's planning to do what? She's pl He's planning to, to conspire against her. He's planning to go after her right so even if you don't know what it means to have designs on someone we can read the situation and see okay she is aware of something she doesn't know how to escape so she does all these things because she knows that he is after her okay so he's after her in some way okay um orange yellow last one on this section right here according to the text how will the community acquire the funds to purchase the barn Right, right down here, we ought out of the common purse to pay for this barn. They're going to all pay for it together. Okay, um, so this could be through things like a common purse might be through taxes. Probably, right? Uh, it could be through uh, a common collection, which would be like taxes. Okay, uh, so together they're going to pay for this barn. All right. Now, I think there were only two questions left, and they were all down here. Okay, number 10. As it is used in the text, the word indemnify likely means what? Uh, now, the easy way, obviously, would be to look up the answer, but uh, let's take a look at what it means to indemnify. So it either means to punish, to make one less angry, to make up for something, or to make one hungry and homeless. Okay. So if we go back up here, let's find the word indemnify. Um, to indemnify. Oh, we used yellow last time. Let's choose a different color here. Uh, let's go with blue. Okay. And thus indemnify the owner. Okay. People are, think about it. People are gathering funds to pay for the owner's um, barn that they are planning to burn down. So they're willing to compensate or make up for this loss. Right? They're, they're willing to compensate or make up for his worldly actions. Or, sorry, for their actions of, of against his, like, worldly goods. Right? So they're paying to make up for something. Right? They're paying to make up for his barn. Uh, and then the last way, sorry, the last question. In what ways are the people and the owls similar? Okay, this is one that, you know, is, can be a different answer depending on how you see it. Right? But we know that the owl ran away from those she was afraid of. We know that the people attacked and got rid of the, their fears. The thing they were afraid of. Right. Um, we know that, you know, she she's taken to extreme. She leaves her home and and where she's from in order to run away. Um, she's she's driven by fear. Right. She's she's afraid. And that's why she goes to the beer, to the barn. Sorry. Blah. She goes to the barn. The people right are also really afraid. They're they're also motivated by fear. Um, each of them. You know, when they meet each other, there's fear. It's just fear all around, right? And, and it's kind of like the impact. This whole story is about the impact or the, the repercussions or the consequences um, of, of, of fear. Sorry, it's hard to write and talk at the same time. Uh, so we really see kind of what happens when we've been really afraid. Okay, those are all 11 questions. Um, sometimes, you know, Brothers Grimm stories can be a little bit tricky, but once we kind of break it down... And you can see how even if you don't have the language of the terms like simile or hyperbole or, uh, you know, some of you guys were saying metaphor, imagery, like they were all great arguments for the words that you were looking for. And you were able to explain yourself really well about why you thought it was or how that language was being used. Don't be afraid of, you know, if it's one word that you're stumbling over, tell me about, you know, for example, the, the simile or the situational irony or, you know, um, some of these right up here, how it's being used. 
and don't get stuck up so much in the one word that you might not know or the one term um, because if you can explain it things by saying things like over exaggeration it's just being too much or you know they're comparing things I don't know why but they're comparing you're getting across that same idea right and I'll help nod you in the right direction uh, we're going to really be looking at a little bit more at the ideas of similes hyperboles metaphors as we continue forward um, but I just don't want you guys to stress out and if you don't know one question or one answer um, for example uh, say number two you could just say uh, you know I'm not sure you know uh, I see an exaggeration He's being silly. But, you know, tell me that you're not sure about something because I don't know what you don't know until you, you tell me you don't know it, okay? Uh, don't be afraid of kind of handing in an assignment that has one or two, I'm not sure what this means. Um, and from there, you know, I can kind of adjust and we can, you know, create lessons on this. But uh, let me know. Um, I'm happy that you guys are plugging away. I love that you guys are trying. I love to see that, you know, some people have been taking that initiative to go out and look for some terms and see if they can match something up. Um, you know, that shows incredible above and beyond in my books. Um, so, you know, again, this is a tricky time. Ask any questions on Teams, on our group Teams. Uh, if you want to see a video on something or a specific term in more depth, let me know either on Teams or you can write it on YouTube. Uh, you can email me, but, you know, just, just let me know. Uh, I hope you guys are all doing really well, and I will see you guys next week. All right, bye.